Today we are joined by Simon Dell, who is the director and coordinator of the Morning Guides, and he's written 17 books. I don't know how he has time to write all these books. And in 1997, he was awarded the MBE for services to the community as well as Dartmoor Rescue. Uh, and when he's not doing all that, he's leading guided walks as a volunteer education guide for the National Park and also uh, for the Lundy Island, for the Lundy Field Society. Uh, so he's really involved in a whole range of things. He's also uh, the chair of the Princetown History Society. And when he's not doing all this, he's writing for The Times, he's writing for BBC Countryfile, uh, and he's a full-time grandfather as well, so he's got children to look after. Uh, and while he's doing that, he's planning exciting mountaineering trips uh, as well. So we're really lucky that Simon has managed to carve out a little bit of time for us this afternoon in amongst this incredibly busy life that he has. Uh, and he's going to share uh, what he knows about uh, Turwit and uh, the Georgian Improvers. So uh, I'd like to hand you over to uh, Simon uh, and let's uh, welcome in and uh, hear what he's got to say. Simon. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thanks for, for joining me um, on this little talk. Um, the plan is to sort of do about 30 minutes um, about the Georgian Improvers. When Andy asked me if I would do a talk about the Georgian Improvers on Dartmoor, I thought to myself, well, that's Turwit. It's, it's only Turwit. Uh, but actually, since looking into it, it's a little bit wider than just Turwit. So the Georgian Improvers on Dartmoor, um, who were the Georgians and when is the Georgian period? And so the Georgian period um, starts, of course, with George I in 1714, uh, the, the king that spoke barely any English uh, at all, the first of the Hanoverians. And he uh, reigned until the nine, uh, 1727 when his son George II uh, took over um, until 1760. Um, and then, of course, really the George that we're talking about on Dartmoor is George III, and he reigned from 1760 until 1820. And it was, I guess, um, it, during his reign that things started really changing in this country, uh, and especially on Dartmoor as well. He had a son. He had a number of sons. Uh, his eldest son was George, who was, of course, um, the Duke of Cornwall, the Prince of Wales, and because of his father's um, illness, um, he had a physical illness, which led, which can lead, unfortunately, to uh, issues of mental illness, um, including porphyria, uh, which George III uh, suffered uh, from, unfortunately. From the year 1811, George, who later became George IV, became the Prince Regent. The Regency period started in 1811. And um, George was Prince Regent from 1811 until 1820, which is when his father died, and that's when he became King George IV um, until his own death in the 1830s. Um, I'm going to cheat slightly, if it's OK, uh, because some of the academics say that the Georgian period actually ended with William IV. Uh, William IV was uh, uh, the brother of uh, the Prince Regent, uh, later George IV. William IV uh, only reigned for seven years, and when he died in 1837, that's when Queen Victoria took over. So the Georgian period, the Hanoverian period, um, is very pertinent to the story uh, today. During that period of time, um, on Dartmoor especially, uh, by the 18th century, about 50% of all English farmland had been forcibly enclosed. Um, and the Enclosure Acts were, I think, if, if I threw in a personal opinion, a little bit barbaric, a bit cruel. Uh, people were being turned off the land. Um, and so Dartmoor especially uh, was, was no different from the rest of the country. Um, and so the small holdings uh, were being affected very badly. Chalicum, of course, we're all familiar, most of us in the audience, I'm, I'm sure will be familiar with that picture, looking down from where the Grim's Pound is and uh, uh, Firth Corner there. And so Chalicum with the wonderful uh, lynchets and the ridge and furrows, very typical of that period of time. Ploughing by hand, of course, was uh, the name of the game in those days. And sowing seeds as well in the most primitive of ways, whether it's from a bag or with one of these newfangled sowing machine, uh, you know, sowing seeds. Um, and of course, in 1701, uh, the great um, in, in 
farming agricultural man, Jethro Tull, invented the seed drill, which really revolutionized um, seed uh, laying seed sowing uh, in the agricultural world. Do you know, the plague, um, uh, that didn't end actually in this country until the 1720s, well into the Georgian period. And so we were in a very difficult time um, around that period of history. On Dartmoor, of course, um, around the 1720s, we've still got um, rough rudimentary pack horse bridges, pack horse ways and tracks, the clapper bridges on Dartmoor, when you look at some of the, the the major routes, this is the King Way. The King Way going from Mary Tavy to Peter Tavy over Clambridge, for those that know it over the Tavy. That has been superseded a number of times and is now called the A386. Um, and so these very rudimentary roads were uh, being uh, used still. The population in Europe um, doubled in the 17th century. And that led to a great famine in many places, a lot of poverty. Um, and when things went wrong, it really did go badly wrong. Babies were left on the steps of churches um, just to simply give them a better chance. Somebody will pick them up, somebody will take them over, uh, and it's a less mouth to feed. Troubled, difficult, challenging times um, in these uh, 18th century years when a quarter of all deaths that were recorded were as a result of smallpox. And so these bridges and the pack horse ways were very familiar. It wasn't really until you got off the edges of the moors that any wider roads where you could have wheeled vehicles uh, existed, but even those were very, very poor and rudimentary. Um, and a lot of the old um, roads, they, they still exist, they're still, you know, they've been taken over. Um, there's one over the top of Whitchurch Down on the old Plymouth uh, to O'Campton Road, and here's one of the milestones on there, up on Whitchurch Down. This isn't <coughs> a turnpike milestone, it's, it's a pre-turnpike milestone. And so the old road menders, the old road builders of those times really were doing what their forefathers had done for hundreds of years before them. The way marked routes between abbeys, the jobbers ways, uh, there of course is the very familiar Seward's Cross, uh, or Nun's Cross if you want to call it uh, that. And also going across the moors, there's my uh, my granddaughter showing you the way um, along the Abbot's Way with the, the very distinctive posts, the TA stones, of course. Uh, and I do a lot of guiding in that area at Merivale, and they come to life. You actually understand why they're there when the weather's like this, uh, and people understand that going from one to the other, and there's one in the distance there, uh, what it was like in those quite challenging uh, days. And of course, taking your dead uh, from uh, Belover across the moors to uh, Lidford uh, as part of the uh, Lich Way. Uh, of course, that's you know, a, a modern day image. Uh, perhaps we'll assume it's after they've visited Coffin Wood over near Standon Farm to put the body into a coffin. And of course, lime was being used in those days to improve the land very significantly. And so as we come towards the final few years of the 18th century, things on Dartmoor were starting to uh, become a little bit more ordered under the control of the duchy, um, and Teenhead Farm was established in 1780 and was actually in, in constant occupation until 1943 during the Second World War years. And you know, a very rudimentary uh, farm uh, indeed, and their lives of farmers, the moorland farmers, were very challenging and hard um, and they were living hand to mouth, uh, I would imagine, most of the time. If they grew some crops, potatoes for example, um, they could perhaps bring them over to the Saracen's Head or the, the Two Bridges Hotel as it is now, uh, and the potato market. There were two potato markets in the Georgian period. There was one here at uh, Two Bridges and the other was at Merivale as well, where people could uh, bring their crops for sale. Um, and you know, they were living very much, like I said, hand to mouth, and they were uh, doing all their own uh, stuff. Here we have someone um, actually spinning flax into linen, um, and also um, they really were very poor indeed in these rudimentary uh, places uh, that they lived. And if a crop failed, well, 
lives started to fail as well. And so uh, things had to improve. Things did start to improve in the Georgian period and the improvements were significant. And the Morton Hampstead Turnpike Trust was established in uh, the 1770s. And here we have one of the milestones on that Turnpike Road. Uh, this is one up near Merivale, uh, from Tam four miles from Tavistock and uh, 16 miles over towards Morton Hampstead. So the Turnpike Trusts uh, were uh, quite significant. And when you look, if you go up to two bridges and the road to Morton Hampstead goes left up there past Powder Mills and on the way up to uh, Post Bridge, the road to Ashburton didn't exist just yet uh, in 1772. The road to Ashburton really went down past Tor Royal and along what we now call uh, the road to nowhere, past Crock of Gold, down towards Swincombe Bridge and over towards Holm. Uh, but eventually the road to Ashburton was constructed uh, up past Dunnerbridge and here we have another um, turnpike a milestone, uh, which is near the Two Bridges Hotel. And so the turnpike roads started to appear and rudimentary um, travel on pack horses um, started to uh, diminish significantly. When you look at the Don's map of 1785, um, you're looking here um, at uh, South Hessery Tor, you're looking at Hessery Tor, and look at Hexworthy. There's the road going out towards Ashburton, past Hexworthy. Um, the road, obviously, in 1785 hadn't been yet built up to two bridges from Ashburton, but the other roads were, the Tavistock to Morton Hampstead Road, and you've got lots of lines of numbers there, 202, 201, 200. That's miles from London uh, on the Hexworthy Road then there were mileposts, but that was from Ashburton itself, so uh, a very different time. And so in 1785, this map was drawn, and that's kind of the year that really Thomas Turwitt came uh, about onto Dartmoor, because in 1785, he was appointed the secretary to the Prince of Wales, uh, the Prince of Wales, the Duke of Cornwall, uh, the Prince Regent. He was a great friend of the Prince Regent, and that had quite a, a big effect, of course. And so he was secretary to the Prince of Wales from 1785 until 1796. He was also, in 1796, a member of Parliament for Oakhampton uh, for four years. And then he lost his seat. Um, he was also auditor of the Duchy of Cornwall uh, from 96 until 1803. He was Lord Warden of the Stanneries from two, uh, 1803 until 18. 1812. And then, of course, when he lost his seat at Oakhampton, he had to stay as an MP somewhere. And this is where it becomes a little bit challenging because he then became the MP for Port Arlington for four years. And you're all scratching your heads. Uh, I would imagine wondering where on earth uh, Port Arlington is. If you go to a map of, Wh um, I almost said Wales then, we we'll go to a map of Ireland, and of course Ireland in those days was one single Ireland under British rule, and Port Arlington is just there in the middle of that county um, where he was the Member of Parliament. I, I bet he didn't go there very much, of course, and Port Arlington was regarded as what was known as a rotten borough, a rotten or pocket borough, uh, and here we have uh, an image, the, the, the usual punch cartoon, satirical, sardonic image of a member of parliament there on the right paying for his seat in a rotten borough. A rotten borough or pocket borough, uh, they were also known as a nominations borough or proprietarial borough. Um, was a parliamentary borough or constituency before the Reform Act of 1832, uh, which had a very small electorate and could only uh, be used by a patron to gain unrepresentative influence within the unreformed House of Commons. In fact, there was actually one place, Old Sarum in Wiltshire. Uh, that's an uninhib uninhabited hill. No one lives there. But this hill returned two members of parliament until 1832. Um, so that was another example of a rotten borough. And so he then became um, uh, a MP for Barnstab, uh, sorry, Plymouth in 1806. And um, that lasted uh, for six years. And then he became also the Black Rod in Parliament for many more years. He was knighted in 1812. And Thomas Turwitt has arrived on the scene. And his uh, desire was to turn Dartmoor into an agricultural success in 1785. He arrived in 1785. Go and have a look at the uh, the Plume of Feathers public house on the front of it. It's got the date 1785, and that was the date that that building was constructed for the stonemasons from Cornwall to come up and start building a little 
village, a village of agricultural success, a village which he was going to call Prince's Town, in memory of his good friend, the Prince Regent, the owner, the Duke of Cornwall. And so he built his own residence at Tor Royal, of course, uh, and that took a few years to build from 1785 until uh, 1793. And his desire was to turn the whole area into an agricultural success. He was going to have uh, flax crops being uh, grown there uh, for flax oil um, and also used in cooking, but especially in the production of linen. Uh, and flax was used a great deal uh, for um, making uh, linen good quality um, uh, material. And so here we've got a few uh, images there of um, not contemporary flax workers, obviously the man there looking a little bit uh, more 20th century than uh, 18th century, uh, but people would pull it and they would uh, cure it and they would ret it as well, retting flax. You had to stand in water, let it soak, put it out, you could uh, do ret it as well, uh, but that broke down the material so that you could then start to weave with it and make linen. Um, also, um, he had an idea to harvest uh, and grow turnips on Dartmoor, and so his great idea of having crop um, <coughs> um, vegetables uh, growing on Dartmoor it didn't actually come to very much. Have you ever tried ploughing a sphagnum bog and growing potatoes in the middle of Foxtor Mire? Um, it really didn't work out. Uh, potato fields, of course, that was his plan, um, and have hundreds of people working there um, uh, with, um, with potatoes. I regret to inform you, his aspiration of a farming community and success, it all went to nothing, and he was facing uh, ruin, unfortunately. Around this time, uh, not involving Thomas Turwitt, but the Devonport Leet Act of, eight, of 1792 was passed and the Devonport Leet uh, was dug out and that sort of replaced the Plymouth Leet or what we call now Drake's Leet. And here we have it coming down Raddick Hill um, and supplying good fresh water to the growing um, town of Dock, uh, Devonport in Plymouth. What was going on in history at this time? Well, of course, the Napoleonic Wars uh, were going on. And um, what war brings is misery and death and destruction and prisoners. And so the war with France resulted um, in the 1790s in thousands of prisoners being held off, just off Plymouth. And they were being held in the most unsanitary, terrible conditions where smallpox was rife. Um, something even fairly mild uh, could actually wipe out hundreds of men, unfortunately. And the government felt that there really ought to be building prisons along the south coast of the country for these French prisoners of war. And of course, Thomas Turwitt, being the Member of Parliament for uh, Plymouth, uh, he realised that there was an opportunity. And so he put forward an idea to build a war prison up at Prince's Town in the middle of this uh, uninhabited area, which was an agricultural failure. And so in 1806, work started and the prison was opened in 1809. And there is an image, a contemporary image of what Prince, Prince's Town looked like in those days with the great prison. And there was um, drawings uh, done by Daniel Alexander of the prison and the plans, a big circular prison, and to the right of it are the barracks for the soldiers who looked after the prisoners of war. It's rather fortunate that Samuel Prout, an artist at the time, um, drew a lot of the construction of Dartmoor Prison, and he was drawing these sorts of images, the great tripods, the sheer legs that were being used in the construction, the, the, the keebles, the barrows and things like that. And so uh, that really was a, a wonderful social record of the prison being constructed and the prison that opened in 1809 to take in the first of the Napoleonic uh, prisoners. And those prisoners arrived from Plymouth, where they were being kept uh, in the hulks, the old the mastless men of war ships. They were marched up, some of them barefoot. Many of them died on the way. And here's an image um, uh, by one of the prison officers. Uh, Chris Deacon, of them just getting some refreshment in Goldstone Pond up on the top of Port Hill, uh, sorry, Peak Hill, uh, on the way up from Dowsland. And the French prisoners also constructed the church up at Prince's Town as well. 
And of course, we were also at war uh, with America. This isn't a talk about the wars, but it's a war with America. And those American prisoners also joined the French at Dartmoor Prison as well. And here they are marching up in the winter uh, of 1812 to join uh, the French sailors as well. The war with France and the war with America uh, concluded in 1815. Uh, it concluded in rather a nasty way with what has become known as the Dartmoor Mutiny, uh, where many American um, citizens, the war had ended, they were shot uh, and many were killed, unfortunately. Uh, it was eventually sorted out and Dartmoor Prison was left empty. Um, and that is really the story of Dartmoor Prison and why it was there in the first place. And here we now have Prince's Town, constructed from 1785 until 1815. And it's kind of there to stay now, uh, Prince's Town. And Thomas Turwitz still has the lease on the land and he leased out Dartmoor war prison buildings to a company that was making naphtha, a fuel, um, to try and uh, get a bit of money. What else was going on with the with the uh, the improvers, the Georgian improvers at this time? Uh, well, we've got, of course, go to the southeast corner of Dartmoor in 1820, still in the Georgian period, of course, uh, the Haytor quarries and the granite granite. Tramway and Hator Tramway and uh, I know that certainly uh, two of the audience were out there last week with me with a, a small group. Um, there we have the Hator uh, granite industry and the uh, old drawings uh, which show the, the shear legs and the cranes and all those bits and pieces. Um, some of those bits are still there even now and that was last week uh, on a slightly uh, dull day uh, unlike today of course and they had to find a way of removing in the granite all the way down. Can you see way in the distance uh, the sea off Tynmouth? And so um, it was George Templer who uh, designed uh, a railway, a railway that was constructed of granite. Uh, the trains um, of them were pulled by horses uh, coming up from Holwell Quarry. Uh, 18 horses, they say, it took to pull the loads up that steep incline. And they pulled them up on uh, carriages on, and trucks, wagons, which ran on these granite rails. And the um, this image here is from the National Parks uh, ex uh, exhibition over at Park, over at Bobby Tracy. And these are the sorts of uh, wagons that they put uh, the granite on and they were taken down to the Ventivid Basin to be transferred to the Stover Canal, which was already in existence uh, for exporting the ball clay uh, down to Tynmouth. And a new dock was built there, a new quay side. And this is new quay down at Tynmouth uh, with uh, the granite being unloaded uh, from Hay Tor by those Georgian entrepreneurs. And of course, coming back up to Princetown, there were tramways um, and waterways, cycleways, of course, now. And it was Turwit comes back into the frame again. Um, and he's come back in again because um, he is uh, he's got Fockintor Quarry, or it used to be called Royal Oak Quarry in those days. He used the quarried granite from Royal Oak Quarry in 1785 to make Tor Royal. And he uh, decided that they really did need a tramway to go down to Plymouth. And so the uh, Plymouth and Dartmoor Railroad uh, was created in 1823, 25 miles at a cost of 66,000 pounds. And here we have one of the railways uh, going into uh, Royal Oak Quarry, later Fockintor Quarry. People sometimes say to me, why was it called Royal Oak Quarry? Um, I'm not sure. There's no any really great contemporary records of why it was called Royal Oak Quarry. I do, however, know that one of the, the hulks off the Hamoes in Plymouth holding the prisoners was called the Royal Oak. I can't help but wonder if that may have been the reason. In 1823, the Haytor Granite Company uh, took over, was taken over by Johnson and Bryce, who owned uh, Foggintor Quarry, and they bought the name. They bought the name and immediately closed Haytor Quarry, much to the annoyance of the owner, the Duke of Somerset, and so they brought the name and uh, Royal Oak Quarry, Foggintor Quarry, Sweltor Quarry, uh, and later Merivale Quarry were run by uh, the uh, Haytor Granite uh, Company. And so there is still evidence of that tramway going all the way down from uh, Princetown, down to Yelverton, uh, down towards Plymouth, down to Sutton Harbour, around the back of the China House, if you know where that is. It went down all the way down to there. And 
many years ago. There was still evidence of the rails. There's two gentlemen there, not far from Clearbrook, uh, with evidence of the rails. Um, some years ago, if you went out to Yelverton Roundabout, which isn't in this picture, but this is a picture of where Yelverton Roundabout is, you can see milestone number 14 going from the Plymouth and Dartmoor Railway, uh, going across the front of what they call Green Bank Terrace uh, at Yelverton. And that railroad went right across the moors to Clearbrook. There's one of the sheds, uh, one of the stables in the blacksmith's workshop there on the railway line. And around this sort of time, 1835, that's pushing it a bit for the, the Georgian period, but it's still within William IV's time, Lee Moor China Clay Works were opened. And they had a tramway which went down to Crabtree, uh, that's where Sainsbury's is to you and me down at Marsh, uh, Marsh Mills today, and they then joined on with the same line from the Plymouth line which was still in existence in uh, in that period of time. And so here we've got a, a 20th century image of trucks of the Lee Moore clay works going on the shared line which was put there by uh, the Plymouth and Dartmoor Railroad. And they went right across to Lera. And here we've got a, a, a beautiful image, a bit fuzzy here, I'm afraid, uh, but of horse-drawn trucks coming down from uh, the Lee Moore uh, tips, but using the same line that was used by Turwitz Tramway. And it even um, you know, went all the way down into, into Plymouth, past Lara sidings. This is Princetown Railway Station. And it was in 1876 that the Princetown Railway Company took over that track bed. They built a steam engine line. And in 1876, the first steam engine arrived in Plymouth, uh, sorry, in Princetown, on the Princetown Railway Company's trains. It was later absorbed into the Great Western Railway. Uh, but that's well into the Victorian period, so we can't sort of talk about that now. Um, but when you go along, a walk along the G, the old GWR line, here we are, uh, not far from uh, Little King's Tor and King's Tor uh, Halt, um, you've got the line on the left there. That's the old tramway with, uh, looks like staple tours there in the distance. And the tramway came along, but of course the new steam engine line has been dumped on top of it, so cut across it. And that steam engine line, of course, went all the way down into Plymouth, past these sidings at Lera. Can you see the little diagonal tramway with somebody standing on it there in front of the signal boxes? That is the old Princetown tramway going across those lines, um, still being used into the 20th century by the Lee Moore clay tips. Uh, they've now gone, of course, uh, that little line there, but what a lovely uh, image of history. Uh, another image of history, of course, is the Omen Beam railway line uh, going out onto the moors from Princetown. Oh, hang on a minute, 1844. That's Victorian. Um, I can't discuss that. Um, I better move on uh, because we're talking about the Georgian improvers. So really, in a way, you know, Victorian improvers took on from the Georgian improvers. And in, and many of us think that it was Thomas Turwitt who was the great Victoria, uh, the big Georgian improver. But as you can see from from this brief chat, he wasn't alone. The turnpikes were built, the, the Leet uh, was constructed as well. Um, he did his best, he looked like he was going to fail, but he saw an opportunity with the prison. The prison arrived and that secured the existence of Prince's Town. Uh, and so therefore, really, that's kind of the conclusion of the story of the Georgian improvers uh, on Dartmoor. Um, and I guess really, he can justifiably be regarded as one of the primary improvers. Thanks very much indeed uh, for, for listening to that, that talk.